so I want to introduce a wonderful guest. It's going to be a wonderful night. Um, first is Jay. For those of you who don't know Jay, actually, I don't even know. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, if you even know this story, but we were introduced a long time ago over email. And the email was simply, Ben, you need to meet Jay because Jay knows everybody. Um, I think probably being a smart ass, I sent back an email that said, apparently not if you're doing this intro to me. But he, um, you know, we met uh, one evening at a party. I ran into him three times in the next week, and this guy was just absolutely everywhere. Um, and if you're fortunate to follow Jay on Facebook, um, he always has these unique and interesting people he's always with that are surprising. And I think it was yesterday or the day before, just hanging out with Gary Vaynerchuk and just kind of doing your thing. It's uh, it's pretty amazing. So Jay is the uh, the founding partner of Rosenzweig & Company, which focuses on building and designing and attracting talent for uh, with amazing executive teams for some of the best companies uh, in the world. Um, Jay does uh, a few things and, and generally advises companies in California and in New York and locally as well. Um, some companies would be Hooch, uh, companies like Ignited Network, uh, Winston House, uh, and also very active in the community. Uh, and I'm very proud to be on the board of Genesis as well with Jay. You know, amazing. Um, so, I have long admired Shopify, uh, and we're very fortunate to have Harley with us here tonight. Um, you know, this is an amazing success story that Harley was not just a participant of, but a major driver for. Um, I sold my company, my last company, back in 2008, and I moved overseas. And Shopify was really my kind of canary in the coal mine of what was going on with the Canadian tech ecosystem. And it's pretty amazing to see what was going on the landscape changed dramatically from when I left, primarily due to some of the success that Shopify had. Uh, and there are a few things that I admired about them. One of them, obviously, is we thought very similarly about you know working with the kind of the Davids of the world and the world of commerce and helping them grow into into Goliaths. Um, just the innovation that they had, always doing new things, punching way, way, way above their weight class, and more importantly, their involvement in the community and really fostering a lot of that. But the thing that I think was best, which I'm sure you guys will talk about a lot, is this amazing culture that they had. And this was a culture that attracted unbelievable talent. And it was one of the few places where I've ever seen, you know, engineers get excited about working there, designers get excited about working there, marketing people, BD people, it didn't really matter, that entire spectrum. That's a really unique and special place, and still is, even post-IPO. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Harley was a lawyer. Um, made a very good decision there at one point. Um, he uh, he actually did his JD MBA uh, and actually put himself through school selling t-shirts back to the university. Uh, that enterprise grew and he ended up selling t-shirts to 15 different universities across the country. And I'm assuming that was the beginning of that entrepreneurial uh, spark. Uh, at school, he, uh, he started the uh, JD MBA Society and the Canadian MBA Oath. And he's been a mentor and advisor to a whole bunch of different companies uh, but works with company organizations like Founder Fuel, uh, organizations like Extreme Ventures at one point, uh, and Invest Ottawa. He's on the board of the C100, uh, and he advises VC funds like Omers and Fuelist Ventures down in the Valley. Uh, and uh, what's going on now is the uh, the dragon on next next gen debt. Um, I think just the last thing I end off. I think you know for all those folks who are in technology in this ecosystem. Uh, I personally owe a debt of gratitude to the folks at Shopify. Um, it's because of them we can do a lot of things now and stand on their shoulders. You know, no longer do us, especially at, at Hubba, uh, get asked why we're building a tech company up here in Canada. And a lot of that was due to the, the success of Shopify. So without further ado, I'll bring it to you guys. Harley, first of all, thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. You're obviously a very busy guy. Uh, I wanted to start with a personal question. As an executive recruiter, I find the personal questions are often the most revealing. In the Ottawa Jewish Bulletin a couple of years ago, you said that uh, you really went deep in the history of me. Right? I did. Like, when the <laughs> Ottawa Jewish Bulletin years ago. Wow. <laughs> I got my yeah. crack research. No, that's like that's a tier one publication journalism. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently you said in the Ottawa Jewish Bulletin that you feel a special connection and a particular responsibility to the Jewish community, and a desire to mentor young Jewish entrepreneurs. Where does that come from in your life experience? 
So uh, earlier this, this evening, I was just hanging out in the room before, and uh, I don't know if he's still in the room. Adam Nelson was here. Adam, are you still here this morning? Yeah. yeah. So um, when I was about 17 years old, I'm going to turn to look at you. Yeah. But when I was about 17 years old, I just moved back. I was living in, so I was born in Montreal, but I grew up in a, in a weird place called Boca Raton, Florida. Um, and uh, nice place, but not a great place to grow up. A lot of old people play golf. And uh, I moved back when I was 17 to go to McGill. And within my first week of school, my entire life had changed. And many of you have heard this story before if you if you watch any of my videos. But my parents went through some very financial hardship. My father wasn't able to work anymore. And I was given this ultimatum that I could either move back down to Florida and, and live with my parents or stay in Montreal and kind of fend for myself. And I decided that... Um, Montreal is amazing. I was 17, but I can drink and uh, <laughs> girls around. Just it was amazing, and so I decided I'd stay in Montreal. And um, I had to start working. And so I, I tried my hand at a bunch of different things. Uh, I tried to sell vacations. I, I DJed a little bit. Um, I ended up starting a T-shirt company that turned out to be quite successful. But I tried a lot of different things along the way. And when I began to DJ, um, I had met a bunch of people, and some of you may know some of these people that I'll mention. It's the Jewish community, it's a small community in Canada. But I met guys like Michael Ellison, Adam's dad, Ross Paperman, Barry Pascal. And I was I didn't know them. I just I was DJing their son and daughter's bar and bed And that that was the entire dynamic of our relationship. And very quickly they figured out that I was fairly entrepreneurial. I was a go-getter, I, I guess. I was extremely I'm still extremely type A. And they gave me a lot of time more time than, than they should have given me, specifically because I was an unknown quantity. They didn't know where I was going. Right. And they you know, had the goodness of their own heart um, and under, understanding and empathizing with my situation explained to me how business works, explained to me how networking worked, explained to me how the world worked in, in many ways. And again, they, didn't have, they did not have to do that. Fast forward till the last couple of years, things have gone pretty good for me, and, and I'm at a point now where... Um, I feel like I have a responsibility to give back. So if I have to give back, who do I want to give back to? Well, first and foremost, I want to give back to people that help me. And that really, for me, was the Jewish community. It extends beyond just Montreal. It extends to the Canadian Jewish community. It also extends to the startup community. Um, I, I, I've been investing as a, as a very small-time angel investor in a couple dozen companies now. Um, I'm on the board of a bunch of different venture funds. Um, but I would say the entrepreneurial community and the Jewish community are really the two communities that uh, I believe had given me the most, and so now that I'm, I'm in a position to give back, those are the two that I focus my time on. It's quite a jump going from DJing and the future business to becoming the CEO of an incredible e-commerce platform and business. How, how did your early days of entrepreneurship help you to prepare for what you're doing today? So this, may be, this may come as a shock to most of you here who went to grad school or law school or whatever school you went to, but I did not go to law school to become a lawyer, just to be clear. I went to law school to become a better entrepreneur. I did my MBA not to get some job at McKinsey or some job at some big company, and I went to demand me to become a better entrepreneur. And so I think it's, I, I've been planning, uh, at least um, to some extent, that eventually I want to be in a position where I can run businesses at scale. Shoplight today is a three or four billion dollar company, we'll be traded both in New York and, and TSX. Um, I didn't ever think that I would, I would be here. This is it's still somewhat mind blowing to me, but I was always preparing for kind of the next step. And when you're starting out as an entrepreneur, you, you tend to be what I would call this kind of Swiss Army knife uh, sort of paradigm, where you have to kind of do everything. And so selling t-shirts was important for me because I was the receptionist, I was the CEO, I was the head of production, I was the janitor. I, I had to play all these different roles because I couldn't afford to hire anybody. Right. And I think that sort of tenacity and that sort of um, versatility in the early days is really important. One of the things that I worry about today when I mentor other entrepreneurs and other startups is that um, raising money has become this thing that's almost checkbox number one, right? And no one was going to give me any money to, to fund my t-shirt businesses or any of my failed companies. So I, I have to be scrappy. I have to be resourceful. And I worry sometimes a little bit today where access to capital has become almost so, it's almost been easy in some ways. Um, every city, every town has nine different accelerators. And so if you have a heartbeat, someone's going to give you $50,000. I actually think in many cases that does a disservice. In other cases, it's really good. It adds, you know, adds fuel to the fire and, and you can go and go to the next level of your business. But um, I think being a scrappy entrepreneur in your early days actually provides you with a certain um, scrappiness that that you need 
to, to run even multi-billion dollar companies. So uh, talking about scrappiness, tell me how you, uh, tell me about your experience going from ultra demanding client of Shopify to coworker and ultimately COO. I, I mean, I see what you're fishing for here, so I'll, I'll just, I'll just tell the story. Yeah. Um, so uh, in my, in my undergrad, I sold t-shirts to universities across Canada. And the only competitive advantage I had was that I looked like the people buying t-shirts. It's actually, in hindsight, it was a very interesting business because um, all of you have gone to university, I, I suspect, or know people who've gone to university. Um, you have a daughter. <coughs> yeah, good for you. Yeah, it's good for you. But on your first day of school, you probably got a t-shirt, a bag, or a hat that said your university oh, yeah. name, right? Yeah. So my first week of McGill, I saw that everyone's wearing a McGill Frosh Orientation 101 week t-shirt, and all of those t-shirts looked like crap. They don't fit well. The rib of the collar was too big. The printing was kind of crappy. And so my idea was, let me go pitch a better version of an orientation or a better version of a promotional product to the university. And when I showed up and I pitched student council, what I realized was that the person that was signing the check wasn't the person paying the bill. It was the person who had been nominated or elected student council who was writing me a hundred thousand dollar check for these t-shirts. Yeah. Uh, at, the, at that point, I wasn't sophisticated enough to realize what a great business that was, but in hindsight, I do. I also realized that all things being equal, these people on these student councils that were procuring t-shirts for the entire university base, um, they wanted to, they were going to give to someone that they actually enjoyed the process with. And so where Gildan and even our, you know, our friends at American Apparel would go in with this folder of different you know, pictures of t-shirts uh, and would do this big RFP process, I would pre-print the t-shirts and show up with the t-shirts already made and said, this is what you're going to get from me. And I made the process fun. It wasn't wasn't something that I, you know, I created these mini fashion shows in their offices where the guy who came after me showed up in a suit and tie and, and just wasn't exciting. So I built that business up and then um, I had this great mentor of mine who's a lawyer at a law firm called Dentist. His name is Philip Reimer. He convinced me that that t-shirt business had no competitive advantage. There was no moat around it. And the same way that I was able to disrupt a bunch of other companies, anyone could disrupt me. And that if I was going to be a great entrepreneur long term, I need something more than just my undergraduate degree. And he was the reason, he was the one that encouraged me to go to law school. In fact, that year he was teaching law at the University of Ottawa, which is why I decided to go to Ottawa to, to, to learn from Phil. When I got to law school, it became very apparent to me that there's no way I can skip class the way I did in medial. If you, go, if you don't show up in class, and I have some old classmates in the room here, um, I didn't show up to all classes I know, but I showed up to most classes. And I realized in law school, if you don't show up, you fail. So that business model that I developed in undergrad, meeting face to face with all these universities and making the process fun, wasn't going to be possible. I needed a business that ran um, virtually concurrently while I was in class. And so the only thing I really knew about at that point that had been successful was t-shirts. And so I thought, let me go ahead and, and start an online t-shirt store. Around the same time, I just moved to Ottawa, um, which is not the most exciting place in the world, as many of you know. Uh, I was, you know, I grew up in Florida and. I love Montreal, and here I am in Ottawa, where a lot of government workers and a bit of a slower town. I didn't have any friends or family there. But I heard about a group of, of four or five entrepreneurs that hung at our local coffee shop. And I thought, maybe this is my tribe. Maybe this is my new tribe now that I'm in law school. Maybe I'll hang out with these guys. And so I showed up at this coffee shop called Bridgehead in Ottawa every Friday night. And there were a group of entrepreneurs building these new things. One guy was Sam Zaid, who built Get Around. Another one was Luke Levesque, who built Travel Pod. A third one is Aidan Razahi, who just sold uh, trip, um, excuse me, sur fluid surveys to SurveyMonkey. Turned out this was an incredible group of people, and I got lucky meeting them. The other person that was in that group is this guy named Toby. And he was this brilliant engineer who, just, who uh, a year or two earlier, moved from Germany to Ottawa because he met a, a girl who's now uh, his wife. And... When he moved to Ottawa, he couldn't get a normal job because he didn't have his working papers and frankly, probably didn't want a normal job. He wanted to start a business selling snowboards. But in 2004, there were only two ways to sell a product on the internet. You either paid a big agency a million bucks and they built you a custom online store, and that's what Walmart and Canadian Tire and Sears and all those others did, or you were forced to use a marketplace like eBay or Etsy or Amazon. And although the marketplace version was inexpensive, you couldn't have your own brand, right? Any of you buy stuff on Amazon, even if it's shipped by a third party, you still consider it buying it on Amazon. Right? Same thing on Etsy or eBay. And so he realized that there wasn't great software on the market, so he wrote his own piece of software to sell these snowboards. And that's around the time where I met him. And I'd asked him if I could use that software to sell my own products, which were licensed t-shirts, which I bought from Adam Ellison's dad, Michael Ellison. I bought these uh, limited licenses for very small geographies. And I set up this company called smoother.com. Uh, as effective one of shop for customers. And um, I don't know if the entrepreneur in me or the Jew in me, but I always thought I wanted a better deal. 
Okay. <laughs> Love a good deal. So I think he was charging me $29 a month, and I would call him once a week and be like, you know what, I want to pay $20 a month, or $19 a month. It was, it was so silly. I should never have done that. But what it did was it, it, I developed this relationship with Toby, this dynamic where I was kind of this pain in the ass customer. And um, after law school, I did my MBA with Steve uh, at the University of Ottawa. And I moved out to Toronto to practice law for, for, or to article for 10 months. And it was the worst 10 months of my life. <laughs> I hated it. Um, law to me was the opposite, the antithesis of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship was all about meritocracy, at least my, my version of it. The person with the best arm should throw the football, not the person with the famous last name, not the person who's been on the field the longest, the person with the best arm throws the ball in entrepreneurship. And in law, they would literally call me the articling student. That's, that was my name. I was the articling student. And the person a year, a year ahead of me was the first year lawyer, and the third year lawyer was ahead of her. And they would allocate work based on how long you've been there. And I just hated it. And I actually worked at a really nice firm with really nice people, and I'm not going to say the name because you probably know many of them. Um, but... It just, it, it, it killed me. It was, it was the worst year of my life. And if it wasn't for, uh, for Lindsay, who's now my wife, I would not have gone through it. But I realized after that, 2008, I was going to move back to Ottawa and join Toby and, and four, other four other engineers. And together, we were going to build this company called Shopify. So, nice. long uh, answer to a very short question. No, that's great. Uh, I wanted to get back to some of the adversity that you faced and you alluded to. Uh, you experienced real diversity, the, uh, real adversity at a young age. Was there ever a time when you thought things were hopeless? What, what sort of kept you going uh, during those tough times? Um, so I want to be clear. I mean, I, don't, I, I, think that, I think that imposter syndrome, I just want to put that out there, is a real thing. Um, I think that um, no matter how successful you are, no matter how great you do, imposter syndrome leaks into everybody. Yeah. There's this really interesting concept called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, some of you may know it. Dunning-Kruger effect basically says that the more you know, the less you think you know. It's basically the opposite of ignorance is bliss. If ignorance is bliss, knowledge is pain kind of thing, right? Well, I'm pretty knowledgeable now. I know a lot about the world, and it's fucking painful a bit because I realize how little I actually know. And so in the early days, I had this, this um, misplaced... Um, cockiness and, 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 and confidence about my business. And I think that was important when you're 17 years old, you're starting a company. Um, but looking back, I kind of hate my 17 year old self. I, I just, I didn't listen to people. I, I was, I thought I knew everything and now I'm 33 and I feel like I'm very little. Um, but so just to be clear, there are still those sleepless nights that happen even today. Um, taking a company public is, is not a simple task. It's, it's complicated. It's, it's confusing. It's, um, it's, it's a challenge. And so, um, what gets me through today is the same thing that gets me through what I, you know, what I was going through when I was 17 and, and the world and my family was falling apart. Um, it's ambition. I'm really ambitious. And I think that is what entrepreneurs need first and foremost. Um, I may not be smarter than every single person in the room, but I'm always going to work harder. I'm always going to outwork everyone in the room. And, and that's not because I have this innate desire to outwork everyone. It's because I'm just really, really ambitious. I think uh, in addition to the ambition, you need to have the inner strength to just keep moving, just keep moving forward. But that, I think that has to come from something. Yeah. I think for some people, that comes from a place of fear or anxiety. Um, my wife's a psychotherapist, so she analyzes me on a daily basis. Um, and so she talks about two types of stress. Um, I make it this wrong, but, but uh, use stress and de-stress or distress. And so distress is basically, you know, uh, when you're uh, when you're you have that anxiety, uh, you have that stress, and you kind of want to you know, put a cover over your head and, and stay in bed all day. I don't have that. I have the other type of stress, which is that when I wake up in the morning at 6.30 every morning, like, I cannot wait to get out of bed. There's so much I want to do. There's so much I need to get done. And so stress or pressure manifests itself with me in, in sort of ambition. And I, I think that tends to be uh, what I've seen at least, you know, I meet guys like Ben, for example. I think that's a common trait amongst most successful entrepreneurs I know is that there is some stress, but it, it manifests itself into something very positive and strong. Does that make sense? Yes. You get what I'm saying? Okay. Um, an important aspect of UJ Genesis is networking and exposing our next generation to successful leaders like yourself. What factors do you believe led to that success? In other words, what do you think is the secret to getting ahead at a young age? You alluded to your your younger self versus uh, yeah. today. So um, there are some people today that won't return my emails that wouldn't return my emails when I was 17 because now I'm a risk to them or I'm, I'm competitive with them. When I was 17, what I had was I was nothing. And so anyone that I would email, um, they may not email me back, but the reason they weren't emailing back was not because they were scared of me. It was because I was just some pus, right? 
Um, but I had the tenacity. I must have emailed. I remember uh, my first year of law school, second year of law school, I took a corporate finance course, I guess second year of law school. And um, this, this, this fund, this, this company kept coming called Onyx. And I kept reading about Onyx and Jerry Schwartz and Jerry Schwartz. And I got fascinated by this guy, Jerry Schwartz. Like, what a hustle this guy must be. And I remember just kind of guessing his email, like G Schwartz, you know, Jerry at Onyx, like a hundred, and I put it all into the BCC line, and then I put Jerry at Onyx.com uh, in two lines. And so, um, but I would do this, you've done right, and I, but I would do this, I would do this a hundred times a day. Like while everyone was listening to the professor in law class, I was email trying to email Jerry Schwartz. And you know what? Eventually, Jerry emailed me back, and, and, and we were able to meet like that. But I've done it my entire life. And so, what I realize now is now being Harley at Shopify.com. Uh, everyone will at least look at my email, but some people won't respond to it because they don't really know exactly what my angle is. Am I going to try to steal their people? Am I, what am I trying to do here? Um, but I think that where most people get um, get it wrong in terms of networking is that they send three three emails out and no one responds to those emails. They're like, yeah, this doesn't work. That's bullshit. Come on. Like, send 150 emails out and three people will respond. And from those three people, you can kind of build on it. Um, but I think it's lazy to expect that networking is going to happen organically. I also think that events like this um, and, and kind of figuring out who your tribe is, I mean, you can go to a massive conference with 5,000 people, you're probably not going to meet the right people. But you may meet the right people here, and it's not going to be at the cocktail event, it's probably going to be in the elevator on the way downstairs tonight. Or it's going to be afterwards where you know a bunch of people are having a beer outside or something like that. And I think those opportunities exist, but most people miss them because they're trying to sort of follow this path that they're supposed to follow. Um, but I think... Um, I, I think networking is super important. And I think one of the great parts of being um, a Jewish entrepreneur is that um, Jewish people like to help each other. And that's pretty amazing. I'm proud of that. So along those lines, the Jewish community in North America is often identified uh, with entrepreneurship. Why do you think that is? And, and really, what does that mean to you? Um, I completely agree. And I have a very biased opinion about it, which you're all welcome not to, not to agree with. Um, my um, my grandparents are Holocaust survivors. They came to Canada from Hungary, a little town in Hungary called Debrecen. Um, they came to Canada in 1956. In 1956, Canada allowed 40,000 Hungarians to come to Canada because of the Hungarian Revolution. It was a wonderful thing that, that Canada did. And in fact, there's a monument right by my house to that to that whole that whole ordeal. So my grandfather came um, with my dad and his siblings in 1956. And my grandfather uh, needed to put a roof over my family's head and put it on the table. And so for him, entrepreneurship wasn't his passion. It's, that was the necessity. He, he became, I don't know if you guys know the, the Jean Talon Farmer's Market in Montreal. He sold eggs there for 75 years. He didn't want to be an egg, an egg salesman. He didn't love eggs. He wasn't passionate about the evolution of eggs or innovation around the egg industry. Um, he had to make, make some money. And so my dad, you know, uh, he wanted to put better food on the table and a better roof over our head. And now here I come along where... I'm at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where I think it's enlightenment's at the top, where I don't really need to think about some of the basic necessities. And so I'm an entrepreneur for a whole other reason, which is that I love it. I'm ambitious about it. But I think if you go back and you look at why we as North American Jews, and I would even say Canadian Jews are disproportionately more ambitious, dare I say more successful, um, I think a lot of it has to do with that survival mentality that a lot of us have. And... Um, I'm not sure that there's scientific research to back up whether or not, you know, if the Holocaust didn't exist, we'd all be successful. But I don't know, like, there's something in me that I believe that, is, that has had to have a major impact. At least it has on me and my dad and my family. Um, because at the end of the day, like, it's the same reason why my mother was disappointed when I left law, right? She, like, she wanted to tell her friends I was going to be a lawyer. I think even now, maybe now she realizes that it was a good idea. Um, but for a long time, she was disappointed that... Her son, the lawyer, is no longer a lawyer anymore, right? And I think that's not, I think that's sort of, um, I think that has a lot to do with that survival mentality that we're here, we survived, now let's fucking win. Right. One other aspect I think is uh, <laughs> the uh, Jewish community was largely blocked from the, uh, from the corporate world. So by necessity, we started a business. Yeah, look who's laughing now, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, back to your mom, uh, you, you said that your mother has been a powerful anchor in your life. Uh, how important has that been to your success? Uh, so I mentioned earlier that I was fairly naive as a 17-year-old. I thought I could do no harm. Part of the reason why I felt like I could do no harm is because of my mom. Because my mom convinced me, and I'm sure many of you have that same sort of Jewish mother, maybe it's not your mother, but someone in your life who acts like a Jewish mother, who told you that you could do anything you wanted. And 
when I decided I was going to sell t-shirts, she told me I was going to be the best t-shirt person ever. And when I decided I was going to sell slippers, which is a failed company that I had, she told me I was going to be the best slipper salesman ever as well. And um, she was unwavering in her support of me. And even when I said in 2009, Mom, I'm leaving law, I'm going to move to Ottawa, and me and this, this German engineer are going to build this company called Shopify, She's like, look, if that's what you want to do, go and do it. Um, but just make, but do it. Don't, don't half ass it. And so, um, I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her. Um, and frankly, I think that um, I wish she'd be a little bit more discerning about things. It would have been nicer to be like that. Business is kind of stupid, but she didn't. She supported me blindly, and I think that's uh, that's a very special thing that those of us that have it, um, we're very lucky to have that. I want to get back to uh, mentorship a little bit. Uh, you mentioned uh, there, was, there was an important influence uh, on you in the law, um, and perhaps this is the individual you did talk about, perhaps not, but mentorship is obviously an important aspect of UGA Genesis. Besides your family influences, who has exerted the greatest influence on you? Is there someone who you try to emulate or someone who has inspired you? Um, all right, I'm going to preach for just a sec. Um, this is why I've been preaching, I guess. Um, <laughs> I believe there's a big difference between advisors and people you chat with from and mentors. And the reason I said it is because I think most people get this wrong. If you have mentors in your life, those mentors need to understand that there's a commitment there. At least that's how I look at it. The mentors that I have in my life, I expect something from them. Maybe it's a phone call once a month for one hour. Maybe it's a coffee once a quarter. But there is some sort of reciprocal um, and agreed upon understanding of what that relationship means. And I think where people lose or, or, or misuse the term mentor is they meet someone who's inspiring to them. They say, that guy's my mentor. That is not a mentor. Maybe that's an advisor. Maybe that's your uncle who's smart and you talk to him or your aunt who talked to her. Um, I've been able to curate a group throughout my life of mentors. Some people didn't want to be my mentors and I kind of forced them into it, right? And often I force them into it by, by leveraging things. So, oh, your daughter's having a bat mitzvah. Well, I'll DJ her bat mitzvah for free, but I want a coffee once a month with you. Yeah. The second thing that I think is, is interesting about mentorship is that where they make a mistake is um, they all their mentors are kind of the same. So I have mentors in my life who I believe, and I keep picking on Adam here, but I'm good at because his dad's a big part of my life. So uh, Adam's dad, Michael Ellison, he's not only built an incredible business, but he's got the best relationship with his family that I've ever seen happen. His wife and his kids, and you'd agree with this, right? Like your dad probably has never missed a dinner his entire life at home, right? Um, that to me is amazing. I have other mentors who have been divorced five times. The kids don't talk to them, but they have some. They have an understanding of finance that is unlike anyone I've ever met, and that's my mentor around finance. And so I have these different mentors that I can call on whether or not I need advice about my family situation, or I need advice about my business, or you know, now the shop is public and I can invest in companies. I'm not really. I'm not really sure I'm a great investor, so I need someone who can help me putting money into different companies and being being kind of this quasi angel investor. But I think having a group of mentors who understand all these things, um, you know, someone that has become a more recent mentor of, of mine is Joe Vimran. So if you know him from Joe Fresh, and I met Joe through Dragon's Den. And Joe has been able to take what he started, which is Club Monaco, which he was known for, and move so much beyond Club Monaco, and even beyond Joe Fresh, to the extent that he himself is involved in so many different things. And he's been able to escape the, the paradigm or the... Um, the uh, the brand that society and the world and the business community put him in. He's been able to break down those walls and do so many different things in so many different industries. I'm fascinated by Joe for that particular thing. And so when I meet with Joe, that's what we talk about. And I think um, it's easier for me now that, that I have some that people know who I am and know the company. Um, but I've been doing this sort of thing for 10 years now, maybe 15 years now, where I've been curating this group of mentors. And some of them are lawyers, some of them are doctors, some are entrepreneurs. And some of them are just like incredible dudes who I just want to get to know better. Um, and so, yeah, that's also very good advice in terms of, uh, uh, a path towards success for, for, for young up and comers. Absolutely. It's finding the right mentors. Um, one of the challenges for new companies in addition to financing and marketing is finding the right talent at the Shopify. How do you go about attracting the right people to help you grow? Ben and I just talked about this earlier tonight. Um, so in the early days, it's really difficult, right? Because when you're starting a company, you have very little money. And no one knows about you. So getting the best person in the world, um, the most experienced, established person in the world is very, very difficult. So in the early days, we hired almost exclusively for potential, not for experience. And we found people that we thought had the passion, had the ambition, had the smarts, but didn't have the experience because we thought we can give them that experience. And so we, we took a lot of bets on people. And the people that we bet on in the early days, we didn't necessarily make 
a big salary, in some cases made very little money, we get an equity. And in those cases, that equity turned into many millions of dollars for those people. And that's that has certainly changed our lives. Now that we're more established, there are some roles that we just need the best person in the world at. And so, you know, our, our head of data we used to be head of data at Netflix, he just moved to Ottawa. Our, our head of engineering was running engineering at last in Australia, he just moved to Ottawa. So there's some roles that we just simply need experience right now because we need someone who has scaled the company to 600 engineers. And I can probably, we can probably teach that over time, but we need someone who's going to come, you know, with that experience already under their belt. Um, but I would say even today at Shopify, we still hire for, um, for potential and not for experience. And I think that, um, again, there are some roles where, you, you know, uh, I think going, if, I don't think we could have gone public without a CFO that understood how to be a good CFO. Right? It just wouldn't have worked. Right. Um, but I think for the most part, uh, when you're getting started, you can hire for potential not experience instead. And if you can't give them uh, cash, you can't give them a big salary, give them some equity. Make it meaningful for him or her to the extent that when things go well, it will change their life. And hopefully their lives of their children and grandchildren one day as well. Um, that's the way we look at it. All things being equal, I always recommend to draft a great app. You know? yeah. uh, so that's great. Yeah. Yeah. One, one thing I just want to add to that, Jay, um, we also have uh, full-time coaching at Shopify. So anyone at Shopify that manages more than one person uh, has the opportunity to see a coach. And one of the mistakes I find most companies make is they have their directors and VPs to coach, but the executives don't need a coach. I'm going to be very blunt. I've seen a coach my entire life, uh, or my entire professional life. Uh, I will continue to see a coach. As long as, as long as I'm running companies, I think having a great executive coach is super important and an amazing hack for uh, scaling yourself very, very quickly. So part of that going, you know, hiring for potential and experience is also giving them the tools where they can get much better. And we find that by having an internal coaching team, we call it talent acceleration, um, that has been very valuable to us. Great. Um, what, what do you do to relax when you're not thinking about Shopify? Are you ever not thinking about Shopify? <laughs> um, so... Uh, Good question. Um, I don't know why I keep talking about my, like, my parents and grandparents, but my grandparents and my parents had this concept of work-life balance. And you've heard this whole thing, work-life balance, where my dad basically would work at, at, at his job, you know, nine to five, Monday to Friday, and then on the weekends, it would be family time, and the nights would be family time. And um, maybe that was, uh, maybe that's a sign of the times, but I just, I think that in 2016 doesn't work like that. I think today what I look for is work-life harmony. And it's all kind of one big basket of things that I love. And it's my company, and it's my wife and daughter, and it's our cottage, and it's our travel, and we're foodies, we love going out for amazing meals. And it's all just one big, big bag of my life. And so um, I don't. I think it's more fluid than that, you know. Um, so I'm always thinking about Shopify, but I'm always, always, I'm also always thinking about Lindsay and Bailey, my, my family. I'm always thinking about, you know, I, I started taking flying lessons. I'm really getting to, I want to be a pilot and fly myself to Waterloo because there's no direct flight from Ottawa to Waterloo, and that's way more convenient. I'm thinking about that as well. And, and so if you find all these things that you can add to your life, um, then I don't think you shut it off. And I think if you are shutting off the thing you're spending 80% of your time doing, which is typically your work, um, maybe you have to question what you're actually doing. Because yeah. my Saturday morning, this is interesting. Um, I hated, when I was articling at this law firm, I hated Sunday nights. I was a disaster Sunday nights because the thought of Monday morning coming was just, it was it ruined my, my Sunday night. And I don't know how it works at, at, at Tori, Steve, but uh, at, when I was when I was articling, uh, Much better. yeah, I'm sure it's way better for sure. Um, we should make Steve partner if, if there's any partners in the room as quickly as possible. Otherwise, I'm going to take him. Um, just saying. Um, the way they allocated work at this law firm was you got into the office and they would stack up files on your chair. And so the higher the stack was, the longer you had to stay uh, at work that day. But from a, a culture, uh, motivation perspective, that is like the stupidest thing that I've ever like, encountered in my entire life. And I hope they don't do that anymore. But so Sunday was this, was this horrible thing. And I remember saying to Lindsay, um, I cannot wait until my Sunday night feels like my Friday night. And my Saturday morning feels like my Monday morning. And when I get to that point, I know that I'm doing my life's work. And I'm doing that. That's like my Thursdays feel like Saturdays, and it's it's. There's no days of the week for me anymore. There's no thank goodness it's Friday crap. It doesn't work like that anymore for me. And that I think is really important. And that I think is is how you know if you're doing your life's work when your Saturday morning feels like your Monday morning, and vice versa. That's what you should do the rest of your life. Uh, Preachy, I know, but my, no, it's, it's, uh, I listen. I do completely relate. Um, ben Ben alluded to something I'm going to get get to in this next question in terms of. Uh, 
you and Shopify being fantastic Canadian role models. Uh, with all the uh, well publicized problems of research in motion, Blackberry, uh, Talentel or years earlier, there's some doubt that Canada is a great place to have the head office of a tech company over the long term. Uh, first of all, do you buy into that argument? And are there things the Canadian government or Canadians generally could be doing a little differently to help startups and, and, and companies like yours even more? Um, so I don't buy that at all. Um, I don't think that Ben or us at Shopify or Ryan at Hootsuite or Mike at FreshBooks or Dax at Lightspeed or any of the great tech companies in Canada that I think are, are some of the top companies uh, around, I don't think they're trying to build the best companies in Ottawa or Montreal or Toronto or Ontario or Canada. We're all trying to build the best companies in the world. We just happen to be doing it from Canada. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is, I think that business has become geographically agnostic. We raised our Series A uh, in 2010 from Bessemer, $7 million all around, Series B, um, led by Georgian here, 2011 is $50 million, 50 million all around, and Homer's letter Series C in 2013 is $100 million all around. Um, it didn't, we, we weren't picking Canadian investors or American investors, we were picking the best investors. And we were always looking at it that, that we are a great global business. And so um, I do not believe it's, it, you, can, you cannot do that here. In fact, um, I hate the fact that we keep getting compared to Nortel and BlackBerry because it seems like those are the great failures of their time. And I think those companies um, failed for a whole bunch of reasons. I don't think Canada had anything to do with it. I think lack of focus, uh, not understanding product market fit, getting a little bit, you know, fat and cozy, uh, all these problems. It's things. just uh, bureaucracy, red tape. I think those are all the reasons why those companies failed. I absolutely believe um, you can build a billion dollar company, you can build a four billion dollar company here. I think you can build a hundred billion dollar company here as well. And I take that responsibility as, um, <coughs> as a Shopify as a role model, and even myself as a role model, to tell others that you can do that here really, really well. Um, but I think you can definitely do it. In terms of government, um, the nice part of being Shopify is that we get a lot of attention. So we have ministers walking through offices and our ministers running through offices, and it's really great. So I get a chance to talk to them and talk, tell them what I think. I think in many ways, government for, for 90% of the things that government wants to help with, they need to get out of the way and let us just do it. There are some things that need to get easier. For example, it is very difficult to bring people in from Europe and the United States to come work in Canada. Um, whether it's what happened at RBC with the foreign workers issue, something has changed. It's now very difficult to do that. Yeah. Um, there's been some other things that have been really crappy that lawyers are, can, can speak to you better than I can. But for example, there was a section of, I believe this is tax code, called Section 116, which is not fairly infamous, which it basically said that if a U.S. investor, U.S. VC, wanted to invest in a Canadian company, the LPs of that fund have to file Canadian tax returns. That's ridiculous. I mean, that, that prevented any cross-border investment up until 2010. And then a great guy named Tom Houston and a bunch of lawyers uh, went and lobbied to get rid of it. They got rid of it. And now, you know, when Vesper comes to visit us for board meetings, they don't leave Canada. They go around to all the other Canadian companies because they realize there's such great potential, great value uh, with Canadian companies. And so I think there are some things that, that the Canadian government can help with. But for the most part, I think they should get out of the way and let entrepreneurs be entrepreneurs. Uh, um, there are some great, like I think SRED Shred is a great program. If you're just starting, it gives it basically will cover some of your salaries for a couple of years, which is an amazing program. Um, there are things like that that I think are are, are really helpful, um, as long as it doesn't become a crutch on us, because I've seen that happen as well, where you begin to get government subsidies and eventually, you know, you're running a business, but the only reason business exists is because you have this drip coming from the government. Um, but to the first point, which I think is a much more important point, you absolutely can build global, multi-billion dollar game-changing companies from Canada. And I think it actually is, in many ways, easier to do it here. I just hosted the uh, C100 CEO Summit, which I'm on the board of, in the Valley last week. And um, uh, Chamath was there, uh, who basically created, he was the guy that started Facebook growth. He's a Canadian guy. He now owns the uh, the Wizards. Uh, in, I think uh, he owns the Wizards, or owns a piece of the Wizards. Um, and billionaire, amazing investor. And he was basically challenging the group and saying, do you think you can build these incredible game-changing businesses here? And someone in the crowd asked this question and said, what is the attrition rate at Facebook? Or, you know, How quickly do people leave Facebook when they start? And he said he thought the average tenure was something like 18 months to 24 months. Well, the reason that happens in Silicon Valley is because it's so competitive. There's so many different right. um, shiny toys to go play with. I think in Canada, we have incredible schools that, that produce incredible talent. We have great entrepreneurs. Um, and I think the loyalty that we get in Canada is second to none. And I think that um, when you have people that have been with you for 5, 10, 15 years, 
they have great context on the company, they can run faster, they can run as fast as anyone can globally. And so I think actually we have an advantage here rather than disadvantage. Uh, I saw something called Shabbat at Shopify. <laughs> Tell me about that. Um, so when I was in law school, uh, I met this uh, this rabbi named Rabbi Chaim Bayarsky. Um, and he just moved to, to Ottawa to build the Chabad house. And um, you got anyone know Chaim? Uh, yeah, yeah, he's an awesome dude. Um, he also married me and Lindsay. Um, and we started putting tool on every Friday. And I'm not, just to be clear, I'm, I'm by no means um, observant, but I'm traditional and I really give a shit. Um, so we put Tulin on, and um, one of the things that he was noticing was that there were all these, there were these great students, Jewish students in Ottawa, that were moving there from different cities, um, and they were having their own kind of Shabbat dinners, but they weren't all coming together. And he also felt that there wasn't kind of this, this unity amongst, amongst them. And so he started hosting these dinners at, in different hotel ballrooms and all these different places, and at a certain point it just got too big and we started hosting the Shopify. And it's really amazing because we've been doing this now for a couple of years, and I'm now getting emails from people saying, you know, I, I met my husband, I met my wife at one of these and Shopify's, and I've invested in companies that I've met at Shabbat and Shopify. Um, I think the rest of my team doesn't really understand what the hell's going on there, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's really cool, and I'm, I'm really uh, I'm very proud of that. So last question, um, if you could leave this audience with just one thought, one piece of advice, what would it be? Hmm, great question. I'll, I'll, I'm not sure this is the, 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 this is the best thing, but this is something that I think is, is really important because a lot of you are kind of in the same vintage as me, which I'll call 20 years old to 40 years old. Right? Big vintage. Um, <laughs> I think most of our parents and grandparents never had the opportunity to do their life's work during their life. Most of our parents and grandparents worked their entire lives to eventually retire and go do their life's work. And most of that was out of necessity. Some of that was created from some scar tissue that their parents and grandparents instilled in them. But I think we, as this vintage, we have the opportunity to do our life's work during our life. And I think that um, it's not easy to find your life's work. It's not really easy to understand if it is. It's sort of this nuanced thing that you kind of just, you feel it. Um, but if, if you can find your life's work um, early in life, whether that's in the 20s or 30s or 40s, whatever it is, uh, but before you retire and finish your your work, um, I think that creates a very rich life. And I think, you know, I don't believe I'm a workaholic. I think about shopping all the time, I, but I believe I have this work-life harmony. I think the reason I'm able to have a great work-life and a great home life and it all get mixed together is because I was really fortunate to find my life's work during my life. And that's something that our parents and grandparents didn't have the luxury of having. And so um, that's what I would leave you guys with. Thank you. You're awesome, Harley. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks.